Hello everyone and welcome again to another Teacher Joseph podcast. Well, today is rather a strange day because I'm waiting to have my supermarket food delivered. You might not think that strange, but in first world countries there's a certain anxiety and political correctness about the whole thing. Let me explain. Well, first of all, I'm not going to starve if they don't come. My belly is full. My fridge is full. In fact, I'm more worried about where I'm going to put this food when it comes. I'll probably have to rearrange the fridge. That's where the anxiety comes from, because I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm spending too much money, or I have too much food, and I'm worried about it going to waste. But yet, this is the world we live in. We live in a very disposable society, and I'm already eyeing up the carrots, which I can see on the vegetable shelf. Thinking,、oh, I really need to use these tonight before they go off. Why did I buy them in the first place with my supermarket delivery from last week? About the actual delivery itself, well, they said between nine and ten, but yet I don't see them beating a pathway through the jungle to deliver my food. That's a metaphor, by the way. I don't live in a jungle. I'm just saying that if even if there were difficulties, I don't see them rushing to give me my food. Why should I be anxious about that? Because, after all, I have more than enough in the house already. The second problem is the way they actually deliver the food. As usual. They will bring crates of food, because of the environmental problem. The supermarket no longer gives me plastic bags, so the man will sit the crates on the floor. In this case, usually three or four crates. I will have to unpack those crates and put the food in my own bags, which I have waiting and. Prepared. While I'm doing that, the man will step back, fold his arms, and try to make small talk with me. I'll be kneeling on the floor, trying to unpack these crates. So it makes me feel a little bit subservient. It's almost like there's a power thing happening here. I'm on my knees. He's watching me unpack. It just doesn't seem right. The last time he came, I asked him, "Could you help me unpack?" And he said, "Oh no, no, no! I can't do that. But if you want, I can put the crates in the kitchen, on a table, if that makes it easier for you to unpack them." And I thought,、mm, well, actually, no. I would really just prefer if you help me here. <laughs> But of course, being the very polite British gentleman that I am, I am always very polite with them, and I try not to ask them to do anything. There's a few problems with that. I mean, the last time. They obviously noticed that my face. I say they. I'll come back to that in a second because it is just one man. He noticed that my face was becoming very, very red. After all, I am on the floor trying to unpack bags, not in front of a computer teaching on Skype. He obviously noticed this, so he tried to help a little bit by dropping some small jars into bags as I was. Frantically trying to unpack the crates, but what he didn't know was that my face was getting very red. But it wasn't because I 
always feeling tired or because I don't take enough exercise. It's because in my mind, I wanted to say to him, look, you're young enough to be my grandchild. Can you just kneel down and help me here? But of course, British society doesn't allow me to speak that way. And if I did, he could call it abuse. And then they would stop delivering my shopping. So I was getting read because of the things that I couldn't say, not because of the lack of exercise, although that might well have been part of it, now that I think of it. And then, as I unpackage crates, he takes a crate away so that I can move on to the next one. But the whole thing just seems really bizarre, and I'm very uncomfortable with it, especially when they simply watch me. My last problem with the way in which the supermarket delivers my food is something which is part of UK culture. Let me explain. So more and more delivery drivers now are looking kind of genderless. It's not possible to say if they're male or female. Now, I don't have any real problem with that, but because of my age and experience of life, it's nice just to know if you're talking to a man or a woman. But when you're faced with someone who's genderless, you don't really know how to talk to them. Because, you know, here we talk to men, all right, mate. Yeah, I'm all right. You're all right. Yeah. And with women, we tend to be a little bit softer and more polite. But in UK culture now, these, uh, this movement of being genderless or crossing over between genders is very, very common. So if you come to the UK and you get on the metro... Uh, don't be surprised if you're faced with people that look faceless. They, they don't look like you can easily identify what gender they are. Now, let me tell you how I deal with that. I have to be honest and say that when I was younger and this movement started to come in, I was very uncomfortable because I was thinking, mm, well, is that a man or a woman there in the metro? Is it? No. No, looks like a man, but no, maybe not. Oh, low voice. Yeah, it is a man, but he isn't dressed like a man. The way I deal with that, okay, is to realize that I don't need to know. And I need to give people the freedom to be who they want to be. Now, this takes a bit of practice. So, for example... I was in a shop last week. There clearly was a man who was male, at least he looked that way, but on his feet were very decorative women's sandals. And I thought to myself, oh, that's really weird. But then I had to rethink that and say, well, why don't I just allow him to be who he wants to be? That's what I would expect other people to do with me, isn't it? In the life choices I've made. So why is this a problem for me? And in my mind, I wish him well, and I let him go. The same with the supermarket employees. My initial thought is, oh, is this a man or a woman? Or what is this that's serving me? But now I realize what I have to say is, well, whoever that person is, they're on their journey of self-exploration, self-discovery. I wish them well, because their journey is not my journey. My journey is not their journey. So I can just say, well, they're on their journey. I'm going to let them go rather than worry in my mind whether they should be identified as male or female. That helps me a lot, but I still struggle with that. Not because it's a big issue, it's just 
The speed and rate of change is crazy. 20, 30 years ago, it would have been very, very uncommon uh, to see people that you couldn't easily identify the gender. It still troubles me with supermarket employees because while they are watching me unpack my food, then I still want to know whether this person who's watching me is male or female. But while well, they're on their journey, I can let them go. The fact that they brought me my food, I guess I'm happy. But I'm still moving with that, if you get my drift. Well, getting back to this subject of calling him or her they, this is a very polite form of English. When you meet someone that you don't know how to address the person, like sir or madam, mister or missus, you can either ask them what pronouns they want to be identified by, <coughs> excuse me, or you can simply refer to them as they, or, <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, that person waiting over there. To use the pronoun they is often used in job interviews when you don't want to reveal the gender of a person. So in a job interview, if they ask, what does your partner do? Leaving room for you to say whether that person is man, woman or beast. You can say, oh, they fly aeroplanes. They are pilots or they are a pilot, or they are not here today. And you can say this so that um, you're giving them a message that you don't want to reveal the identity, but at the same time, it's perfectly acceptable. So it's not a way of avoiding the question. We often use they. It's something that we inherited from the royals. They often do this. They're very impersonal. The Queen used to call herself we. We are going out when she meant herself. And of course, she used they when referring to her husband and members of her family. So you can use they to avoid difficult questions or when you really don't know who you're talking to. So these days, that word they has been kind of adopted and moved to accommodate people who do not wish to be identified by their gender. On social media, on Twitter, in the English-speaking world, you may have noticed that many people choose to be um, known by particular uh, by particular words. So, for example, on someone's Twitter status, you might see the name, for example, let's say Joseph, Teacher Joseph, okay? I don't have Twitter, but imagine Teacher Joseph, and then it will say he, him, or they. That means that I'm comfortable, I'm giving you permission to call me or refer to me as him, or as he, or as they. You might see another one, John Smith, they. So he's telling you, just refer to me as they, because maybe he doesn't want to be referred to as a man. Women, you might see on Twitter, Jane Smith, for example. Um, her, uh, they, it's a good one. Or it may just say they, if she's transitioning to become a male, who knows? Maybe they're not transitioning. Maybe they just like being outside of the gender they were born into. This is very, very common here. And uh, to clear up any problems with that, it's sometimes better to ask people, how would you like me to refer to you? I don't think it's a hard question. Um, if people are living outside of a gender box, I think it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask, um, especially if it's a close friend. Even with companies like Microsoft and Google now, in their signature at the end, for example, Joseph 
Joseph Smith, whatever. It might have a little bracket, pronouns, um, him, they. Yeah, so look for the pronouns is what I would say. Anyway, I kind of went off topic there. So these genderless beings who bring me my shopping, I'm very grateful for them. And I really shouldn't worry about trying to put them into a box. And there's great learning in that. Because if you can do that in other areas of your life, then obviously you will be more open-minded. You won't necessarily have associations. For example, if you see me as a teacher and you think that's all I am, you'd be very much mistaken, especially when I'm sitting at night eating too much, watching TV with my family. Or when I'm cooking dinner, I'm not teaching then, am I? So you could call me a chef. You could call me a cook. You could call me a family person. You could call me a TV viewer. So these are the things that I do when I'm not teaching. So this just gives you an idea of how open-minded you can become if you release these pre-held ideas that you have about others. It's It works for me, but... It's a very hard thing to do, especially when it comes down to things like gender. I'm really getting used to it with things like color and not to expect people to act in a certain way. So, for example, I remember when my Indian friend met my mother. My Indian friend looks very Indian, but it was his great-grandparents who came here so he's more British than I am. And so when he came to meet my mother, uh, she said to him, Hello, how are you today? I have made you a curry. And he looked at me as if to say, Is she for real? Really? But there are still some people like that. And he was more British than me. Anyway, she made a delicious curry, and everyone loved it. But I think he would have preferred the fish and chips, to be honest. Um, anyway. <coughs> anyway, that's my story. And I'm going to go now before I die of the, of the cold. So see you all again soon, and take care. Goodbye.